World War I brought unprecedented changes across the social fabric of Europe and North America. For the first time, women joined the industrial labor force in unprecedented numbers. Their participation would prove crucial to replace the men fighting on the front lines and ensure the continued production of the stream of war materials needed by the troops. Having done their part to win the war, the women's suffrage movement would take on a new strength and purpose that would ultimately result in the granting of women's suffrage in most of the developed world. Throughout the length of Europe, national patriotism was increasingly tempered by the realization that it was the reigning elites, their decisions and actions, that were ultimately responsible for precipitating the catastrophe of the war. By what right did the old order rule? Judging by the war and its outcome, certainly not because of their wisdom, experience, or prudence. As the legitimacy of the old order came into question, the bonds of subservience and obligation that had supported it steadily unraveled. There was no way that the divine rights of emperors and czars could be reconciled with the rights of the working man. One would have to go. Four imperial dynasties would vanish in the wake of the war. The first of the royal dynasties to fall was the House of Romanov. It would not be the last. Ensconced in the royal palace in Petrograd, Tsar Nicholas II and his family were almost completely out of touch with ordinary Russians. Cocooned and isolated within the royal court, they were oblivious to the enormous cost being inflicted by the war and the economic chaos it was leaving in its wake. The couple had five children, four girls and a boy. Tragically, the heir to the throne, the Tsarevich Alexei, was a hemophiliac. He was subject to uncontrollable bleeding after even the slightest fall or bruise. Desperate to find a means of dealing with her son's hemophilia, the Tsarina Alexandria had fallen progressively under the malign influence of a purportedly holy man from Siberia. Grigory Rasputin has been described as a psychic, a mystic, and the mad Siberian monk. He had a near hypnotic influence on the Tsarina and through her was able to influence government policy. As the war news got progressively worse, the House of Romanov began to totter. And Rasputin's divisive role in the royal household would tip it into the dustbin of history. By the spring of 1917, the seemingly never-ending defeats of Russian armies by the Germans had left Russia in chaos. Russian industry was failing beset by manpower and raw materials shortages. The cities were desperately short of food and fuel. Repeated requisitioning of draft animals for the army had led to a collapse of the transportation system. Russia was on the verge of collapse. In February 1917, spontaneous demonstrations had started in Petrograd and other cities throughout Western Russia. The protesters had demanded bread and an immediate cessation to the war. The Petrograd garrison had at first opened fire on the protesters. Then they joined them and called for the removal of the Tsar. On March 15, 1917, Tsar Nicholas II abdicated and was put under house arrest. The Romanov dynasty was finished. The next day, a new provisional government was announced. It too would be short-lived. On November 7, 1917, a second revolution erupted. Well-trained Red Guard units under the control of the Bolsheviks took over the banks and key strategic transport and communication facilities. The members of the provisional government were arrested. The next day, Vladimir Lenin, the Bolshevik leader, declared we shall now start to construct the new socialist order. The world's first communist government had been established. The entry of the United States on behalf of the Allies was one of the pivotal events of World War I. Suddenly, America's industrial might and financial resources 
became available to the Allies. More importantly, the powerful American Navy was now available to safeguard the Atlantic crossings. The Allies had gained an important new ally, not to mention the availability of millions of new recruits to take up arms against their German foe. The United States had issued a declaration of neutrality at the outbreak of the war in August 1914. Wilson had spent the period from 1914 to 1917 trying to keep the United States out of the war. As the war progressed, the goal of keeping America neutral became progressively harder. Three factors, unrestricted submarine warfare, German-led sabotage of American munitions plants, and the Zimmerman telegram would ultimately precipitate an American declaration of war. The sinking of the Lusitania had prompted President Wilson to warn Berlin that any further sinking of passenger ships or neutral merchantmen would force the United States to take action. The declaration of unrestricted submarine warfare against any ship, belligerent or neutral, in the waters surrounding Great Britain had prompted Wilson to sever diplomatic relations with Berlin. Still, he stopped short of an outright declaration of war. In February, American public opinion was further inflamed by the loss of four U.S. merchant ships and 15 American lives to German submarine attacks. Slowly but surely, the United States was inching closer to war. From the start of World War I in 1914, there had been an active German spy and sabotage ring in the United States. Throughout 1916, there had been a series of fires and explosions in facilities producing war supplies for the Allies. The worst incident had occurred in July in Jersey City Harbor, the Black Tom Island explosion. The Black Tom facility was a major munitions depot on the East Coast. On July 30th, approximately 900 tons of explosives and detonating fuses scheduled for shipment to the Allies in Europe mysteriously blew up. German involvement was suspected, but never proven. Acts of sabotage continued throughout 1916 and 1917. Anti-German feeling continued to grow. America was inching closer to a declaration of war. On January 16, 1917, the British intercepted and decoded a telegram from the German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmermann to the German ambassador in Mexico. In the telegram, Zimmermann proposed that in the event of war with the United States, Germany and Mexico should form an alliance. Germany would fund Mexico's conflict with the U.S. in return for the use of Mexican ports as submarine bases. With victory achieved, Mexico would regain her lost territories in Arizona, Texas, and New Mexico. The revelation of the contents of the Zimmerman telegram inflamed American public opinion and added fuel to the rising anti-German sentiment. Neutrality was now impossible. American public opinion would not stand for it any further. On April 2nd, President Woodrow Wilson went to Congress and asked for a declaration of war against Germany and Austria-Hungary. America was now at war. The arrival of American troops on European soil had changed the rules of the game. The German general staff was convinced that the only route to a German victory was to launch a major offensive along the Western Front before the added strength of American forces became overwhelming. With the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk on March 3rd, 1918, Russia had withdrawn from the war. 33 additional German divisions were now available for deployment on the Western Front. Germany now had 192 divisions, almost 2 million men on the Western Front. The Allies had 178 divisions. Their armies were sorely depleted and were suffering from low morale and a lack of unified command. On May 27th, the Germans launched their spring offensive. In the words of British Field Marshal Douglas Haig, it was a gambler's throw. 
it came very close to succeeding. The assault began by an artillery bombardment from 4,000 guns along a 24-mile front. Simultaneously, the Germans launched a gas attack. The British positions along the front were virtually wiped out by the opening barrage. The attack was followed by an advance of 17 divisions of infantry commanded by Crown Prince Wilhelm through the gap that had been blasted in the British line. In six hours, they reached the river Enna. By the end of the first day, they had arrived at the river Vela. In three days, the Germans had taken 50,000 prisoners and 800 guns. Allied armies began to withdraw in the direction of Paris. Desperate for reinforcements to block the German advance, the overall Allied commander, General Foch, pleaded with General Pershing to commit his American divisions. American troops were rushed in to seal the breach and check the German advance at Cantigny and Bella Wood. The Americans were finally in the war. Along the front, German troops continued to advance towards the Marne and beyond it, Paris. By June 3rd, advanced units of the German army were within 60 miles of Paris. On July 15th, German forces launched a new attack against French lines at Reims. Their intent was to split the French forces, cross the Marne, and begin